Hi everyone, we'll be with you in a few minutes at half past five exactly, so grab yourself a drink if you haven't already and we'll be with you very soon. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the penultimate session of our BTO Annual Conference 2020. We're sorry that this year the pandemic means we can't meet you in person, but it's exciting to see that over 90 of you have joined us live here today on the Zoom webinar, and even more of you on YouTube and Facebook. Whether you're a regular attendee of the BTO Conference or this is your first time, I'd like to say a very warm welcome from myself and the team at BTO. My name is Faye Vogley and I'm the social media manager at the BTO and alongside this I work with a lot of our youth engagement work. I'm your chair for this evening but you won't be hearing too much from me because we've got two fantastic hosts for you who will be moderating tonight's panel discussion between our CEOs. Both of our hosts are part of the youth advisory panel at BTO, a fantastic initiative that we launched earlier this year 
where we've invited 10 young people to help us create a youth engagement strategy to help BTO better engage a young audience across the United Kingdom in ornithology, science and nature. The panel has done exquisite work this year and they presented their final youth engagement strategy for the next three years to the board earlier this week. We're very excited about the work that they're doing and we hope you are too. You can find out more about this on our website. During tonight's event, if you have any questions for our hosts or the CEOs, you can post those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And whilst you're down there, if you see any questions that you like, you can give them a thumbs up so that that way they are upvoted and more prominent and might have a higher chance of being asked. We're very excited to bring you tonight's panel discussion, a conversation between Andy Clements and Juliet Vickery hosted by two of our fantastic youth advisory panel members. They will be introducing our CEOs to you. So for me, it's my privilege to introduce you to our two fantastic hosts. First of all, I'd like to introduce Megan McCleverty, who is 17 and based in Buckinghamshire, where she's currently studying for her A-levels. Megan, do you wanna join us and talk a bit about yourself? Thank you, Faye. My name is Megan and I'm a young birder and wildlife enthusiast from Buckinghamshire. I've been involved with the BTO since 2017 when I attended the bird camp and I've been volunteering since at Bird Fair. I'm currently a member of the youth advisory panel as Faye mentioned and look forward to working with our new youth representatives in the near future. Fantastic, thank you so much Megan. Our second host for tonight is Samuel Levy. Sam is 20 and he is based in London and also a part of our youth advisory panel, currently studying at university. Sam, do you wanna say a bit about yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Samuel and I'm, I'm currently studying um, ecology and wildlife conservation down at Bournemouth University and um, a part of the youth advisory panel as well and I've been um, serving for the BTO actually since um, 2015 which is quite quite a long time for me but yeah. Fantastic thank you Sam. Now as I promised you won't be hearing too much from me tonight so I'll hand over to Sam and Megan for what I know will be a fantastic conversation with our CEOs. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening. And um, so first of all, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Andy. So, um, Andy, if you could tell us a about your favourite part of um, being CEO. Thanks very much indeed, Sam. Good evening, everybody. It's really great to be part of this conversation with Juliet this evening. And it feels very proud moment to be hosted by two of our wonderful youth advisors from our youth advisory panel. I think we're gonna have a great discussion uh, this evening. So what's my favorite things about uh, being the chief executive here? Well, there's so much you can say, um, which is, uh, um, I'm just gonna to switch to speaker view, I think. There we go. So there's so much uh, you can say about, about being uh, in a leadership position in an organization like the BTO. And I think overall, I've been around here 13 years now. And the thing that is amazing is witnessing the journey of growth and development over more than a decade that this organization has been going through. When I arrived, we had about 12,000 members. Now we're knocking on the door of 20,000. Uh, and when I arrived, we had a turnover of about four and a half million, and now it's about seven million. But much more than those bold figures, what I really think is important is that this is all about the people. The BTO is an extraordinary organization, partly because of the commitment and the knowledge and the brilliance of the staff in this organization. Um, we're a science body uh, who engage lots of people, but our scientists are hugely well qualified and um, really clever, you know, and uh, being part of an organization that is so full of that committed scientific effort is really important. Um, but also, of course, the BTO uh, is proud to be able to say it has about 50,000 volunteers in the public who undertake all of the work that gathers the data that can become the body of science for the organization. And our staff and our volunteers and indeed our trustees and all our supporters, there's something about working in the conservation sector 
uh, working with natural history and nature, you're just surrounded by very nice people all the time. And that, that's one of the greatest things about being part of this organization. And when you watch confidence in, in, in the way we do our work, when, when you watch that confidence grow, it's really wonderful to see how it leads to achievement and to real innovation. And I think this conference actually over the last week, the BTO's first annual conference, which we've had to do online for obvious reasons, um, that you can really see how innovation has been, has been at the forefront of lots of our work, be that about tracking Arctic skewers, uh, publishing the wonderful book Red 67, <clears throat> or learning how audio recordings massively increase our knowledge about migration going on at night uh, while we're all sleeping. So there's so much I could say uh, about what's great about being very privileged and honoured to play my part in the history of this wonderful organisation. The last thing I'd say, Sam, is that le leadership, you know, I think it's about learning too. And little did I know that the last six months of my leadership here would, would be uh, impacted in the way it has been uh, with the COVID and, and the pandemic. But even through this period, I feel that BTO, together, we've learned such a lot. Uh, we've become a really stronger community and I'm pr really proud of the way we've looked after one another. So, you know, that's a bit of a thumbnail for me about what I've enjoyed about this job. Thank you. So we're also very excited to have Juliet with us today. So to introduce yourself, could you please tell us a bit about your path leading up to your appointment as the incoming CEO? Thanks very much, Megan, and, and hello to everyone out there. Um, so I think, I had a very classic traditional academic start to my career, so PhD, postdoc, lectureship, um, and that took me to some great um, locations and great birds. I did waterway birds in southwest Scotland for my PhD, Brent geese on the North Norfolk coast for my postdoc, and then during my lectureship at Edinburgh University, I got very interested in Afro-Palearctic migrants uh, as they winter in sub-Saharan West Africa. So there were always research that was geared up towards answering conservation questions, but I really wanted to work in an organization for which that was its core, I suppose. So you can do this in academia, but it's much harder to, to get your work to have an impact. And that chance, the first chance to do that was with the BTO. So I took up uh, now about 20 years ago, the post um, of head of their terrestrial ecology team, leading a group of scientists that were working around the ecology and conservation of farmland birds. And that was really all about trying to find how to uh, create space, if you like, for birds like skylarks, yellowhammers, lapwings in this really intensive agricultural landscape, how you integrate the needs of food production and conservation. So that was a really great 10 years um, at the BTO, but I was also quite keen to, I suppose, experience other NGOs. And when the chance came up to move to the RSPB and lead their international conservation science, it seemed too, too good an opportunity to miss. Um, and um, so I grabbed that one and moved and had another 11 fantastic years um, working with great people in amazing places, all about conserving globally threatened sites and species around the world. And learning, really learning, you know, again, how to use your science to understand and conserve the natural world. So again, you know, great 11 years and just like the BTO, I didn't necessarily want to leave, but another chance came up. And of course, that chance was to come back to the BTO uh, in the hugely exciting position of CEO uh, and lead an organization at a time that I think the, the need for our work, the BTO's work is just so important, uh, both to engage people and to understand and conserve our natural world. So academia, NGOs, really excited to be here. That's great. Okay, let's get into the questions then. Just as a quick warm up, what was the last bird you saw? Now, this is a question for both of you. So why don't we start with Juliet? So the last bird I saw, so I went out cycling this morning. I'm a bit of a cycling fanatic and uh, the most notable, I, I'm sure, was really a buzzard uh, sitting on a telegraph wire. It's fantastic to see buzzards now in East of England. Um, 10 years ago, we'd have seen none, I guess. Um, but the last bird I heard was a tawny owl, uh, which I can hear often uh, in my house at night, which I love. So I'm quite lucky, isn't it? That's two quite nice species. 
Yeah, I'm very jealous, Juliet, that uh, you can hear tawny owl from your house. Um, so the last bird I saw, Megan, uh, was this morning, and it was a jay cashing acorns. And, uh, it, you know, it's a great thing to see. It's really a seasonal thing that birds tell us about when they're behaving in that way. And, um, you know, they're, they're kind of really beautiful birds too. Uh, bright pink in some, in some lights and, you know, very jaunty and uh, quite an exotic looking thing. So yeah, Jay was the last thing I saw this morning. I have to admit, I absolutely love um, seeing Jays around and the, that little patch on their wing is quite incredible as well. Um, so my next question to you guys is, um, what inspired you to get involved with the natural world? So we'll start off with Andy. Uh, thanks, Sam. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that blue on a jay's wing because I, I wasn't going to say anything about this, but it's reminded me that even when I was at primary school, we had like a nature club thing going on in, and, and you could bring, bring things in from the natural world and, and put them on the table. And I found a jay's wing and I put it on, on the table and that vivid blue and black panel in the wing, really uh, amazing to see. So what really got me going though, and, and this is the story of many of us, I think, was a mentor and a, and a teacher who really encouraged me. So in secondary school, uh, my biology teacher, uh, he, he's called Barry Gota. And uh, it, was, it was his enthusiasm uh, that helped me along. And, and he, he got me to create a, a bird club at the school and we did local bird watching near to the school, but we also went on trips at the weekend. And um, interestingly, al although it was birding that I, I took up, and he is a birder, still is now in his 90s, um, he, he, he was a famous entomologist and he, he was very interested in moths. So the whole kind of natural history thing was part of that. And, you know, I am interested in wider natural history, but birding always comes first. And then the last part of this story that is important to me is that my best birding friend, a guy I go birding with regularly every year, is Barry's son, Rick. And, um, you know, we're just, it, 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 it's just that initial spark, isn't it, often, from somebody who's willing to give you the time or encourage you in a certain way that sets you off on a journey to end up, you know, in places like this. It's really remarkable. That's, that's incredible. I, I love stories like that. I mean, mine, mine is not too dissimilar, but um, now to Juliet. So what's, what inspired you to get in, uh, involved with the natural world? Thanks, Sam. So I'm, I'm going to answer that and then perhaps, Perhaps you and Megan could also share your views because I'd love to hear about that too. So that's a kind of advance warning and ask the question back to you. So I answered this question a little bit in the podcast. So apologies to those of you who've heard that um, if it's a repetition, but I obviously can't reinvent how I got into it. I was always really interested in environment and the natural world and conservation, but I really sort of, I think I fell into birding by this fantastic stroke of good luck which was as an undergraduate at Oxford University, I chose for my um, research project, a project looking at swifts nesting in the University Museum Tower. I did that project with a fabulous uh, scientist and ornithologist called Chris Perrins. And that was project was all about how egg laying in swifts relates to weather patterns. So quite a simple question, um, but it obviously exposed me very close up to these extraordinary birds and also taught me two things which I think have lived with me um, since then. The first was how this quite simple data I collected revealed really interesting patterns um, uh, about the natural world around me that I, I hadn't really seen or noticed before or wouldn't notice without those data. And the second was the way in which these birds were such a fantastic indicator of what was going on in the world around them. And that ability of birds to tell us so much more about the natural world than just the state of birds, I think has again lived with me through a number of my research projects ever since. And of course now classically at the BTO where we use this wonderful breeding bird survey data to capture that national long-term picture of what's happening. And we know that that indicator is, is you know, really strong and powerful around the rest of the natural world within the UK. So that's how I got into it. So it was all about Swift. 
Um, and I am forever grateful to Swift and also to uh, Chris Perrins at Oxford who helped me hugely uh, off on the right track. So how about you, Sam? Perhaps we could ask you that and then perhaps you can pass to Megan before your next question is back to us, if we may. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but I mean, for me, it was, um, I have to admit, it was sort of, um, it, there were inspirational people along the road, a bit like Andy. But um, it, for me, it wasn't teachers. It was actually family members. So for me, it was um, my great aunt and she she took me out into the countryside and it was one of the first times I'd actually um, been out of the city properly, if you like, um, into the countryside. And there wasn't a lot of things to do um, when she took me there. And um, one thing she gave me was my notebook, which I showed on Wednesday and it still sat next to me on my desk um, here. Um, and uh, she told me to write down all the birds that I saw on the bird feeders. Well, I say she told me, actually, it was kind of voluntary. Um, I ended up writing down all the birds um, that I saw in the bird feeders, and that got me hooked. Um, and then, yeah, here I am today, effectively. Um, so how about you, Megan? <laughs> I have to say my story is a little bit similar to yours in the sense that my family were quite a key part in sort of a young age getting involved in wildlife because I've always been encouraged to sort of get outside get involved go to nature reserves and that's always been part of my life I also had uh, a lot of exposure to things like Springwatch, David Attenborough and I always had access to that media and I still do uh, today and so sort of seeing that from a young age has been really inspiring okay so the next question um what can organizations do uh like the BTO to help combat climate crisis and this one's for you Andy Thanks very much, Megan. Um, so the first thing I'd say is that uh, what I think we have to talk about now is the climate and biodiversity crises together. Um, I think it's really important to link those two things. The climate change is, is so incredibly important, uh, but overall, uh, we, we need to fix both of these things uh, together at the same time. And Juliet has already alluded to the fact that birds are very powerful in telling us things about the natural world. And um, so I think the BTO's climate change work would fall into three areas for me. So the first is documenting what the impacts are of climate change and using birds and, and their population trends and, and their survival and that kind of thing. And phenology, how birds tell us things about uh, the seasons and how the seasons are changing. The second area is that we can develop approaches to predict the future impacts of climate change, and that will help build the evidence base for what we might want to do about it. And of course, the third area is that we can improve that evidence base through our conservation work on how conservation will help us to adapt to climate change. So there are three kind of big things there. Now, BTO has been on this gig with climate change for a long time. Uh, before my arrival, you know, there is a, a very well cited paper by Humphrey Crick uh, and other authors looking at how the laying dates of, of birds in the UK, egg laying dates of birds in the UK are changing as, as um, time goes on possibly and probably as a result of climate change and subsequently we've done kind of lots of other uh, papers if you go to the BTO website and click on our science and find climate change in there there's a wealth of information about the published material um, and we've done things like contribute to broader global biodiversity reviews on the impacts of climate change on, on wider biodiversity and then uh, more recently, uh, we've done studies on the relevant roles of different factors. So it is quite difficult to tease out whether changes we're observing are the result of climate or land use or, or some other factor. And we've begun to understand how to do those analyses and inform decision makers about what to do in terms of adaptation. Um, that all sounds a bit kind of, I don't know, uh, sort of, theoretical and a, and a bit kind of uh, sciencey, but I think communicating that work is really, really vital. And one of the ways in which we've done that is we've looked at data that, that our volunteer bird watchers collected 40 years ago 
in a survey called the Inland Observation Points Network, where they went out to the same hill or place in the countryside and ob tried to observe the arrival, the first arrival dates of summer migrants. And then we've looked at our bird track data from 40 years later during the last decade or so, and we've compared the dates of arrival of summer migrants. And one of the most astonishing findings is that in that 40 year time period, San Martins have advanced their arrival into Britain uh, by three weeks on average every year. And it's a really um, resonant way of demonstrating how birds are adapting to climate change. So I think there's lots the BTO can contribute here. I don't know whether Juliet wants to add anything to what I've said on this one. Well, maybe just a couple of things, if I may. I mean, the work, first of all, perhaps is to, to try and explain a little bit why this, you know, advancement of arrival of migrants and, and laying is, is not just of interest as a pattern. Um, most of you will know that birds are fantastic in how they co coincide the time when they need maximum insects to feed chicks with their chick rearing period. And that those two things are really carefully matched. Um, and what's happening, of course, is that they're advancing as the insect flush advances. Um, so early laying and early arrival allows them to do that to some extent. And of course, the concern is that there'll come a point at which, um, you know, the birds simply can't advance anymore or can't you know, migrate any earlier. And, and that's called what we call phenological mismatch. So a mismatch between the peak of insects and the peak of, you know, the birds need for those insects. And, and that ultimately will call a, a breakdown, this wonderfully close ecological network that we currently have. So it's just to explain a bit why, you know, that, that knocks onto other things. And then I think also, as Andy said, a lot of the work that the BTO can do now is also around solutions um, to obviously not necessarily addressing climate change, but solutions to it. So things like understanding from the data we have where birds are now and why, where they might move in the future under different scenarios of climate change, and therefore what you might think about in terms of areas to protect or to connect in the future. And then all this, fabulous SIBO tracking data that the BTO are doing with others um, to really understand how you can, I suppose, if you like, harvest our, our waters for renewable energy with wind farms, but also not compromise them for these internationally important populations of seabirds. So knowing where birds forage and how they forage helps us to understand where to, uh, if you like, avoid for wind farms and, and how to construct these wind farms in a way that's least damaging. So I just, a couple of things to add really around, I think, really important role that we can play uh, in, in the whole climate change sphere. Yeah, thank. Can I add a couple more? Actually, uh, Julia has prompted me. So, um, the that study I talked about, where San Martins have advanced their arrival, we also found that some of the summer migrants haven't managed to advance their arrival into Britain. So, birds like cuckoo uh, and swift and nightjar, for example they are carrying on arriving at the same time of year. And what our researchers have discovered through tracking data is that some of these species are waiting in West Africa, south of the Sahara uh, at the early part of spring for the rains to arrive. And, and the tropical rains are not subject to the same climate variables as in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's raining at the same time of year every year in the tropics. And these birds are stuck there waiting for the rains. When it rains, all the termites and insects emerge en masse. The birds feed up on them and that's the fuel they use to get back north across the Sahara. So in a sense, they're kind of stuck in some way and aren't able to adapt maybe as much as San Martins. And then the other thing that Juliet said that prompted a, a, a memory of mine is that we undertook a piece of work uh, about uh, five or six years ago that looked at the special protection areas for birds uh, across the UK. These are particular areas of land, many are, are on the coast, that protect huge numbers of birds using the UK at different times of year. And we looked at the performance of those under different climate scenarios. So, so that's the second bit of the climate work I talked about, thinking about tools that can be predictive. And we found out that these areas are, whilst the, the birds in them may change in future, they remain some of the most important areas for birds long-term into the future. So it really informs the decisions that these protected areas must stay protected for a very long time. 
that's really cool I, there's a lot of things there that i didn't know about before so that's really good to hear but um also worrying in other aspects as well um following up following up from this um julia i was wondering if you could answer this um do you think there is a place for the bto to start um lobbying or approaching governments and organizations to to do more to help um, protect the british uh, birds and wildlife as well thanks sam uh, and i will answer that question but just to refer back to what you just said which is you heard things there from andy and myself that you weren't so aware of and i think that's one really important thing in terms of uh, um having an impact putting aside the lobbying and campaigning you know we do some fantastic stuff but we don't tell enough people loudly enough about it and i think we need to try and think about how to do that better and i think you the youth advisory panel and now the youth reps will be enormously helpful uh, in in helping us communicate that better and my phrase is more boldly you know to many other people so something perhaps to come back to so that the campaigning and lobbying question is a really challenging one for the bto because I think, as, as you all know, and many people who've, who've kind of uh, listening in, is one of our unique selling points is that we are this honest broker. So in many, many situations in conservation are conflict, you know, different interests coming together um, and they're often sensitive and often, you know, complex. And because the BTO is, is um, this honest broker, it can play a really important role in trying to resolve those conflicts. And the question I suppose I need to ask myself and, and us as an organization going forwards is if we begin to campaign and lobby about even one issue for which the science might be very strong, does it compromise our ability to play that honest broker role across the board? And, it, and is that worth it, if you like? So that's one thing that to think about. And um, interestingly enough, we had something similar in the AGM, a similar question. And I would like to reflect back three things I learned as a scientist working for the RSPB, which is, of course, a hugely strongly and effective campaigning organization. And, and the first thing is that campaigning effectively is, is a very um, skillful job that requires strong investment in staff who understand who makes decisions, how they make those decisions, how you can feed into it. That's all really important and it requires investing to get it right. The second thing is, as a scientist in the RSPB, uh, no matter how robust and independent and strong your science is, um, you will always have to work a little bit harder to, to be you know, really convincing that it's utterly neutral. And that of course is not an issue for RSPB. And the third thing is not to underestimate how important science is in that lobbying and campaigning. So the policy colleagues I worked with, I lost track of how many times they said how important science was as this center core for their argument. That's what they pinned their argument on. Gave them a seat at the table, where as policy colleagues, they might not have had it. And it brought them uh, credibility with other audiences because it was based on science. And this is what we need to do as a BTO, get our science to center stage and tell people about it when we've done it. So I suppose what I'm saying is if we ultimately want to, uh, you know, conserve and protect the natural world, there are many ways to do that. Campaigning is one of them and very important, but so is that science. And if we were better as an organization at showing how the science that we do based on data that you all collect was working in the same way, maybe we wouldn't worry so much about whether we should or should not campaign. So I feel very strongly that we have a, we have a much more of an impact than we never articulate and we need to do better at that. And I really want to work with, you know, these advisory panel and, you know, all of our members to do that better. Um, so any thoughts you have around that, I think would be, um, great source of future conversations. So yeah, thank you for a really good question. That was really, all those points are really interesting to consider, especially because I think from a young person's perspective, sort of com communicating, campaigning online is such a bigger part of our engagement with the natural world. So it's really interesting to consider that. Uh, just before we move on to the next question, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Andy? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Megan. And, and I'm, I'm really interested in what you just said as well, that, um, you know, from a, from a young person's perspective, it, it, it's quite often the campaigning that, that springs to mind straight away. One, one of the things, I mean, I, I think Juliet answered that question really wonderfully, and uh, it, 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 it just underlines how lucky the BTO is to have somebody moving into the leadership position here that has that expertise and experience from more than just this organization. And I think that will bring a real focus to the, to the work and increasing the impact. 
the thing I would say as well um, is that there are there are lots of other organisations that are campaigning for wildlife, and if the BTO moves into that space, we will lose our unique position in the space, really, which is very very valuable to us because you know that there aren't organisations like ours that have the um, respect from long-term data sets. The, some of these data sets have been collected, you know, for decades now. And, and all, of, all of that data underpins so much conservation effort. And it's the reliance on our objective science that makes that data so powerful. And I think if we move too far away from that, those original values of the organization, we lose the space that we occupy. And I think Juliet's really, really right to say that we need to occupy that space more strongly and make it clearer the benefits of being an objective science-led organization with a fantastic, wonderful group of 50,000 volunteers that collect the data upon which all our work is based. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, so moving on to another topic. So I know that myself and some of the other members of the Youth Advisory Panel have written about diversity and birding uh, in the past. So for example, the article I wrote on women and, women and birding after International Women's Day and some of the things that uh, Arjun and Sorrel have written. So we wanted to know, do you think that the BTO has done enough to promote diversity and conservation and how will uh, BTO promote diversity in the future? And this one's for you as well, Juliet. Thanks, Megan. So I think, you know, this is very close to my heart. And so the first up question, have we done enough? No, we have not done enough. Absolutely not. Um, but we're on it. So I went to a uh, discussion amongst NGOs where I heard this really quite startling uh, fact that I think 3% of environmental professionals identify as minorities from minorities compared to 12% of the population. So we have such a long way to go. But um, the BTO is already beginning to think about how we really do get better at this. So I think, you know, there's a diversity working group we set up uh, to think about these things, but there are lots of things we can do uh, right now. So I think what people emphasize is you need to have your leadership committed to making change. So, you know, big tick here for BTO, I'm absolutely committed to make a difference around this. So it has to come from the top. I think the sector has to work together and I've joined a group of CEOs in the NGO uh, green community, if you like, to think about how we can work better together. So we're not all reinventing the wheel and we can support each other in these things. That's also definitely true. There are simple things we can do now. So things like um, having, uh, you know, bl blind refereeing of, of papers in our whole kind of, you know, environment and arena, um, having adverts for posts that are checked for whether they're biased towards certain groups. Um, that's a very simple thing to do to make sure that you're not putting off people at the very beginning. Uh, we know that access and appeal is a really big barrier to many people from particularly um, the, the black, Asian, minority and ethnic groups. So there are all these things that we can already do. Um, so thinking about it across the board. But perhaps most importantly, it's about listening to the groups that you want to engage with and really understanding what the barriers are, recognising that I don't understand them. It's not something that I can you know, really understand, but really listening to them. And I think if I may say, again, you, the Youth Advisory Panel, epitomise why this is so important. So, you know, BTO wanted to engage with a young audience. Um, so they've gone out to you to listen to that. Um, number one, I think that's really important. But um, listening to all of you on Wednesday evening at the live panel that you did, what really struck me was something that people have said repeatedly, which is don't expect one person from that minority group to represent the views of that whole minority group. Um, and that's a trap we often fall into. And when I listen to the diversity of all of your backgrounds and experiences and views across that panel, it was so apparent why that's so powerful because you bring, you know, you represent maybe not everybody, but certainly a very big cross section. So, you know, listening um, to that group and really acting on it, I think is really important. And I hope you'll help us with that. But, but I think commitment from the top, you know, myself and already, you know, the senior leadership at, at BTO are clearly committed. We have the working group set up. We will set targets. So we will be held to those targets and we have to make a difference. So um, please hold us to that um, again as a youth group looking in from the outside. Um, so, yeah, we haven't done enough, but we are really going to. 
that's really good to hear. Um, Andy, would you like to add anything from that? Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Sam. All, all I would say is, you know, that is such a delight to hear the way in which Julia answered that question, because I think it gives a very clear message that the future leadership of the BTO will be uh, carrying on what we've just only started, but really uh, making a difference from here on in. And, you know, those two things that are so important that we've learned very much through your work in the Youth Advisory Panel to listen to your real experiences and to understand that if you don't see yourselves in the sector, um, if you don't see yourselves represented, then you're unlikely to want to become part of it yourselves. And um, I feel really proud that uh, the work that has already been done at the BTO to, to bring together the Youth Advisory Panel and the fact that you're diverse and talk about diversity and push the organization to do more from your perspective. I think that's very, very powerful. Thank you for that. Just before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to um, say that we will be moving on to an audience uh, Q&A very shortly. Um, so, if anybody does have any questions, then please feel free to pop them in the um, Q&A chat box at the bottom of the uh, panel in Zoom or online uh, through YouTube or Facebook. Um, so Andy, the next question is for you. And that is given the way that, the, that young people communicate and interact with each other um, has changed over the past uh, few years, do you think or do you feel that this has um, change the way that young people interact with nature and the BTO? Thanks, Sam. Well, clearly social media is very important to talk about in this space. And we're very fortunate once again at the BTO to have had excellent leadership in, in the development of our social media um, by Faye Vogley, who you've seen earlier tonight. The audience will have seen the introduction from Faye, uh, who very modestly said, as well as being social media manager, she spent a bit of time on, on the youth work. But of course, it, it's her leadership that has really enabled you guys um, to begin to become involved uh, with us. So social media ways of, of communicating clearly are really important. And um, I, th I think a lot of nature gets shared. I, I use Twitter myself. And um, a lot of the community that I engage with on Twitter, uh, it includes many of you on the Youth Advisory Panel, but it also includes lots of birders who are sharing pictures, sharing information, talking about identification, talking about uh, the science of ornithology and birds. And, and you know, uh, there's a lot of young people involved in those, those parts of the discussion. And, and I, I think it's very important that all of us embrace that way of communicating and interacting with each other. The other thing that's kind of really come, come across from talking to you guys is that it enables the building of an online community. So you, you have all come together as a youth advisory panel and you've, 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 you've a number of you said the other night or on Wednesday evening's panel discussion, how important the community that you've created has become for you. And I think, I think that's really important. And one of, one of the youth advisory panel, you know, really, really talked about how it, it helped some of the, the, the downsides of the way society communicates nowadays, um, bullying and that kind of thing. And, and, and that the online community that you have has enabled you to share difficulties amongst each other and find support. And I think that's really helpful. But, you know, what Matt said on Wednesday and what Matt would always say, and Matt is one of the other members of the Youth Advisory Panel, is you can't beat being outside in nature and, and birding and, and, and being active in the field. And what that's kind of music to my ears because very often, 
particularly from you know old white men <laughs> that like me you sometimes hear oh all this all, all kids want to do now is look at their phones and do social media and I think what what we learn from seeing all of you guys how active you are in the field those values that we all had as children about wanting to be out birding wanting to be out in nature you still hold those so I, I think the combination of those things those two things can be very, very powerful. And, and I think it's really important to recognize that um, all the social stuff that goes on and that we can see now through social media is only a very small part of the story. And, and being out in nature and encouraging more young people to be out enjoying nature and seeing things uh, and, and learning about things is so important. And I think the last thing I'd say about uh, the way you, you as young people are engaging with all this stuff is that you're making birding and ornithology cool again. That's what I think. Yeah, I think we all have to agree with Matt there. There is nothing better than getting outside and getting involved. Um, but I have to say over lockdown when we couldn't get out as much, it was really good to see everyone online sort of sharing their knowledge and experiences. Um, just to follow up on that question, uh, Juliet, how do you think the BTO needs to evolve to keep up with these changes that young people are making to the wildlife community? Thanks, um, Megan. And, and again, yes, I'd quite be interested to pass this question back to you two as well. So I'm just giving you again my little heads up that I might ask you the same. I think there are a number of things I would say is, is communication moves so fast now. So I think the key is to keep changing, to keep being nimble and move as we need to. to if we want to engage a diverse uh, cross-section of society we need to communicate in different ways and we need to be moving to make sure that we are uh, capitalizing on the new the new ways that people are communicating so definitely and that's where again you guys will be really important feeding in what are the new ways that that younger generation are now communicating um, so that's one thing I was again struck again by uh, I think it was Arjun that talked about how this the social media had created a community for him uh, I think in London perhaps where he thought he was birding on his own and suddenly he's not um, so that is obviously hugely powerful, the kind of reach, um, you know, far and wide, but also creating community uh, where you are. I was really struck by, by that. Um, so I think being nimble, keeping diverse. And I think the other thing would be really interesting to think about is how to communicate across generations. So we've got now, you know, you've helped and appoint these youth representatives who are scattered, you know, you know, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland teamed up with, with regional representatives who are uh, another generation, my kind of generation. And I think and also understanding how they can communicate better. What would be the best way of, of um, communicating across that, that big generational gap? Because I think, you know, you would be surprised to know that social media is quite a barrier to them. Um, and I think there'll be some bit of reverse mentoring going on around that, actually, which would be really nice to see. So I think that's what I would say. But yeah, I mean, I think thoughts from you, really, it would be also interesting to know if you think there are bits we need to be moving on. You've all discussed TikTok, it's coming up as something that everyone kind of either rolls their eyes about. Yeah, so sound shaking is <laughs> okay. Should we move on from that one then? Anyway, I think, yeah, it'd be nice to know what, what you think might we could do better or, you know, evolve into. I've actually heard of a birder on TikTok now. I think Maya Bambrick's moved on to TikTok, <laughs> uh, which is interesting to see. <laughs> Um, but in terms of yeah, youth engagement with the BTO, I think there have been some massive steps and great steps with the youth advisory panel, the youth reps. It's been really good to see. But I think actually just helping people get out and get involved is the most important thing, coming back to what Matt said. Uh, but also, I have to say, there have been some negative perceptions around young people and birding. I know initially with my friends, I had the same thing. But just sort of getting people who maybe haven't considered it as an interest before, maybe through schools or through other links and just showing them sort of what's out there, really, and just getting them out and involved. Yeah. Sam, what do you think? I was going to say, I, I pretty much agree with everything Megan said. But um, I mean, I think part of the way the BTO is evolving to keep up with the changes is by bringing on uh, the youth advisory panel and the youth reps. And um, I think going forwards, it's it, uh, the BTO just needs to keep providing su the support to the youth reps and the youth advisory panels that keep coming on board with the schemes. And um, I think if that happens, we can help create this community that will overcome some of the barriers that we've mentioned previously. And um, yeah, I think I think it's it's looking quite the future is looking quite rosy, I guess is the way to put it. Um so yeah. Right. 
I think we're now ready to move on to the audience Q&A. Um, so let's have a quick look. So we've got a question here um, on Zoom from Peter Sutton. And um, he has asked, I don't know who wants to pick this one up, but um, he has asked, um, do you think that the recent DEFRA proposals for agricultural and um, land uh, the question has disappeared. No, there it is. And and the um, environment and the proposed environment land management will help reverse the decline in farmland birds. Oh, I don't mind having a go at that first, uh, Sam. Um, so thanks, Peter. Great question. Um, the quick answer is we don't know uh, yet. But the long answer is that I hope BTO is going to be engaged in helping to find that out. Um, what I think is really important as an opportunity with the new environmental land management scheme is that um, for the time we've been in the common agricultural policy, the majority of the three billion pounds of support that has gone into farming has been used on the basis of, of people owning land and not necessarily doing a lot of good with, with it for the environment. Whereas the intention with the new environmental land management scheme is to pay public money for public goods. So the, the basic payment scheme, as it was called, is being phased out over the next um, five years or so. And we are expecting there to be more uh, environmental measures put in place. Now, uh, not least because of Juliet's decade of wonderful work at the BTO before she went to the RSPB, BTO has got a really strong, rec strong track record in this space. And uh, I expect we will be uh, contracted again by government to help the design of the measures under the new environmental land management scheme and also the monitoring to find out if those are working. I don't know whether Juliet wants to add anything to what I've said. I can say something quickly, but I'm aware that you probably want to get to be more questions, have lengthy answers to all of them. So, so you need to also prompt us if you're monitoring the questions coming in. The only thing I would say is um, clearly there's a huge potential, but we mustn't underestimate the, the massive job in reversing bird populations over a broad landscape scale. So we've done pretty well in the UK on these sort of, I would say, range restricted species like, let's say, cell bunting and corn crake, uh, which are obviously affected by agriculture. And we've been able to chuck quite a lot of money at them in small areas and really make, make a difference. Uh, when you scale that up, the challenge is, in, is hugely more difficult. So and I think we know what to do. We know what the birds need, but at the scale uh, that they need it is the big challenge. So I think we, we're hopefully on the right track, but we mustn't underestimate the scale of change needed to reverse the sorts of declines we've seen. Got another interesting question from the people watching. Uh, so, um, oh, sorry, it's moved again. So really ple pleased to hear um, commitments to diversity and inclusion and some ideas on how to progress that. How can we measure progress and identify shortfalls in any policies? Yeah, I think this is key. Having targets is important. They're not the whole answer. And they also come obviously with challenges too around, around targets and, and how you reach them. But I think that targets are important. So I think one thing that we will try and look to do next year, I'd like to look to do with the diversity working group is thinking about what sort of targets we can set, uh, particularly around staff and recruitment. So I think that's one thing I would say. Things like all your staff doing unconscious bias training. Um, I think that already happens to a great extent in the BTO, but really committing that we will all do that if we're recruiting. I think that's really important. Uh, and looking at throughout a whole HR system, what can we really embed diversity? Can we really make sure we aren't falling into traps that we know are there and very easily, you know, fallen into? So I think all of those things and, um, you know, us, us ourselves speaking out, being inclusive, making sure that the language we, we use is the right language, which of course, again, is talking to those people that understand it. So I think, but I do think targets are important. And I think that uh, we have to commit to some targets and be held to those targets. So I think that was one thing I would definitely say. Okay, so the next, uh, Andy, is there anything you wanted to add on that or? Um, okay, so the next question is uh, another is for Juliet. And this is, um, you've touched on 
engagement and how um, so vitally important it is in uh, communicating with all sorts of um, people and organizations about BTO work. But are the BTO really engaged with their current members and supporters? So I was wondering if you could take that one on. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, in a way, I suppose we have to ask our members and supporters how engaged we are. So I think we're doing a we're doing a lot more to get engaged. And I think actually these, funnily enough, you know, these kind of remote Zoom and virtual uh, conferences and events have helped us a lot. We've got much bigger engagement, um, and I think also more people, perhaps willing to ask questions uh, through a chat bar than maybe standing up in a room. I think all those things help. So uh, I think that's um, certainly certainly a good thing. I think having stronger country offices in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, recognising that um, there are better ways to do things in some of these countries and perhaps always in England where our headquarters is. I think that also will help, I hope. Um, and our fantastic regional reps who are embedded in these communities um, and, and very much part of the, the local kind of, you know, bird scene, I suppose. But I would say that if um, perhaps the person who's asked this question or any others out there feel we're not connected enough and we're not doing enough, then you know, let us know because you, you know, members and supporters are the core of what the BTO does. Uh, and if what we're doing now isn't connecting in the right way, then we, you know, we need to know that and we need to work on that. But I hope through diversity of, of communications, YouTube, social media, the website, the newsletters, that we cater to everyone. I'm sure we don't, um, but do let us know, people out there, if we're, if we're not getting it right. So that would be my response to that. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to add some some thoughts to what Juliet said. You know, one one of the one of the things that we've borne in mind over the last decade or so is that um, whilst we want to broaden the appeal of the BTO and and meet new audiences and and increase diversity of our constituency of support, we're we're so fortunate as an organisation to have the loyal commitment of people for forty or fifty years or more. And what, what I hope we've been doing, but we might not have been doing it well enough, is to bring all of those loyal supporters with us on, on our journey. And I think that's why organizations like the BTO need to think carefully about how they change and not leap from one thing into another, but, but change in a way that enables that loyal support to come with us on, on that change uh, uh, process, really. Um, while I've got the microphone, Sam, can I ask, can I answer a couple of more questions rather quickly? So there's, there's one from Sarah Nathan, which links to my point about special protection areas for birds. And she asks, has, have we got evidence about the conservation of those important areas so that they don't get undermined as we leave the European Union? And we absolutely have evidence about that. And and, and that evidence comes from our volunteers and it comes through the, the wetland bird survey, which people are undertaking once a month throughout the mainly the winter months. And we have a webs report online where, for example, all the nature agencies in the UK can visit that online resource and get completely up to date information at will taken in the way that they want the information that informs the benefit of those uh, special sites uh, to those birds. Uh, so I think that's a real positive. And then just near that question is one from Peter Gordon that says, are books passe? Well, given the launch of the, Euro the uh, European Breeding Bird Atlas number two this week, I definitely don't think that the BTO would say that books are passe at all. Thanks. Um, got another interesting question from Jeremy Greenwood. He wanted to follow up on something you said earlier, Andy. Um, so how can we use teachers, uh, teacher members to do even more in that line, especially to introduce young people into the BTO? So um, thanks, Jeremy. Good to see you and hear you on, on here today. Uh, I don't know whether Megan and Sam know that that, that means there are three ex-CEOs or existing chief executives on the call this afternoon. Jeremy was my predecessor. Um, it's a great question, but I'll tell you what, the people that can answer this question better than anybody are Megan and Sam, because one of the elements of the uh, Youth Advisory Panel strategy that we heard at the BTO board yesterday is exactly on this point, how um, they, can, they are advising the BTO 
to reach schools and universities uh, in terms of the curriculum and encouraging people, uh, teachers uh, uh, and university teachers to kind of put nature into the curriculum in a variety of different ways. And, and there, the young Youth Advisory Panel strategy has some really good initiatives about that in it. I don't know whether Megan and, and Sam want to say anything more about that. Well, I think it's been interesting with um, the new youth reps because something that we've talked about them doing is going into schools and talking to the people there because I think as a young person hearing stories from other young people is really inspiring because it just sort of shows you that you can do what they're doing and you can be engaged as well. And it also sort of, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of coming across it. And we've also talked a little bit about online resources as well. So sort of blogs written by young people from a young person's perspective can sometimes be sort of a new way of looking at things and be quite interesting. Sam, do you have anything else to add? Um, I think the only thing that I can add is that um, in terms of how we can use teacher members to sort of actually help us uh, further along the line, it's something we're looking into uh, something we're looking into doing is actually creating a sort of teacher panel that could help us to um, come up with ideas and help to shape the um, the I guess the um, the resources that we want to help to send out to schools so that they can be more tailored towards um, what schools need and to fit in with the curriculum. So um, yeah, I think it's 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 definitely something that's going to be it's an, it's, it's basically work in progress at the moment. I think is the way to put it. Um, so I have another question here. I think this might end up being our last question. Um, so, it, um, so it's been mentioned that in other sessions that the offer of the free membership of Garden Birdwatch has been a huge success this year, and that um, some have joined have also joined the BTO itself. Will this be represented, and does the BTO know if this has improved the age range of existing members? So, is there anyone who would like to take that one on? Well, I'll, I'll have a go, but I can't answer the second part of the question. So, what we'll do is uh, we'll communicate that to our team. And, and then they'll find out about um, the age range if we can. However, I'm, I'm not certain that when people uh, join our schemes, we ask them for age related information. So I'd, I'd need to check, yeah, I'm getting a message uh, while I'm talking that we don't have age data for all our BTO members, um, especially recently. And of course it's not mandatory. Uh, unless uh, our members are, are under 18. So we won't be able to find out that at the moment, not retrospectively anyway. Um, in terms of the future of Garden Bird Watch Free, you know, this has been a remarkable success during the pandemic. Uh, it's been a success for BTO that uh, we've engaged many more people in our work. But I think more importantly than that, it's been successful in enabling those people during very difficult times to engage with nature in, in um, uh, some, some further way. So um, we're thinking about how we, we look to the future uh, with Garden Bird Watch and, and, and how we have Garden Bird Watch alongside our other membership, but it has been a really important initiative during this pandemic to enable more people to engage with nature and to realize the benefits of being able to do that. Juliet, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, not really, except to say that I think the other thing about um, Garden Bird, which of course is that, you know, it really does bring nature on your doorstep to you um, and, and that more than anything else. And I think that kind of potential to really um, engage, you know, more people, we've seen the value in lockdown. Um, I think it, you know, was hopefully something that we could give back to society during lockdown that was important. Um, and I think it'd be great to understand really what people have got from it as well. So we know lots about the birds from, from the Garden Bird Watch. It'd be lovely to understand more about what it really meant for people and how we can make that experience better for people um, uh, for their own, you know, sheer joy and you know health and well-being what can we do that will improve that okay sam and i decided to write you a quick surprise question 
Uh, so this is addressed to both of you. If you had any advice you could give to the youth advisory panel and the youth reps, what would it be? Stick at it. You're doing a fantastic job. Just keep going. You know, one of, the, one of the things you did right at the beginning of your work was identify barriers. And in all aspects of life, we all come across barriers and, and things we have to get across. And what I've been so impressed with in, in your work to date is that that's, what, that's your approach. That's what you do. You, you discover things that might get in the way and you collectively think about how to fix them. And if you can keep doing that and stay committed, you've got a wonderful future ahead. Yeah, so I would say the same. I'd also say, and I'm sure this won't be a challenge for any of you, hold on to that kind of magical energy and enthusiasm you have, because I think I said before, you know, that will be utterly inspiring uh, and, and engaging and infectious. So, you know, hold on to that. Um, there won't be successes every time along the way, but support each other in that. So working as a team, I mean, I think I'm, I like think I'm a team player. I like being part of a team. There are big strengths about that. And, you know, there'll be times when some of you will be struggling a little bit and it might not be going quite as you like, and others will be having a great time. Use that to, you know, feed off each other. But as Anna said, stick at it, stay doing what you're doing. It's amazing. And don't underestimate the breath of fresh air, fresh air you are the minute you walk into it at the moment a zoom meeting room and talk to us because you know it really is and um yeah I wish I could explain how how much that means to us but just yeah stick at it and and support each other thank you for the advice there it's really good to hear it coming from you guys um so finally we're just going to end off uh, with a couple of really quick uh, like questions and so my question to you both is um what is your favorite birding snack um who wants to go first andy i see you've got your your um you're unmuted so feel free to okay, fire away okay. so i would have said snickers which, you know, they used to be called marathon bars, the ones with peanuts in and stuff, chocolate bars. But I went, I, I do go birding in other places around the world occasionally. I went to China and every day we had more than one Snickers bar during long days of birding. And I don't think I can ever look a Snickers in the face again. <laughs> okay, for me, anything chocolate. I love chocolate. Obviously I prefer, you know, palm oil friendly kind of you know but yeah basically if I'm hungry I'll probably eat any chocolate you pass me really <laughs> hey I've got some chocolate for you later Julia I'm gonna come upstairs <laughs> how about you two will you answer that for us um <laughs> so for me it's um probably a dried mango or um or maybe a biscuit or something like that I was going to go for a dried mango because Sam and Arjun and I are quite well known. Well, especially Arjun is well known for that snack. Much healthier than ours, eh? Yeah, much healthier. <laughs> I have to say raisins next time. Okay, just another quick question. Uh, what's your biggest birding ID fail? Uh, and I've been asked to quickly mention that Faye once mis ID'd a rock as a dipper. I'm sorry, Faye. <laughs> So mine's, mine's a bit similar. When I was at university at Bangor in North Wales, we used to go up to Dumfries and Galloway goose watching every winter. And we were in the minibus one time driving along near the side of Loch Ken. And I could see all these geese in a field in the distance. And I shouted, stop, you know, it's the green and white fronted geese. We found them. And we stopped and got the binoculars on and they were a group of molehills in the field. So, so I think I, I, unlike probably every other CEO, I have not come to the BTO as a hardcore birder, um, which makes me a bit different. I've had countless ID fails, which I too numerous to mention probably. So actually in a way that wants me to make a slightly more serious point really, which is I think understanding the birds you're looking at, knowing what these species are, will really enrich your birding experience. But you shouldn't worry if you don't know what it is. You can still watch whatever it is you're watching in your garden or out in some green space. Uh, and and marvel at the the colors and the behavior and you know all of those things without knowing what species it is so i think i just like to say rather than that because they are too countless to mention don't let that stop you enjoying birds around you it doesn't matter you'll add to it by knowing what they are but for goodness sake you know just love them for watching them um even if you don't know what species you're looking at 
No, that's that's really good advice there. Um, I mean, I I always say that you should always call everything out, even if you don't know what it is, just so that other people can get onto it and give you the ID, or or, one, or at least help you with the ID anyway. But um, just quickly and finally, um, so we 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 ran out of time um during the Q and A. So um. Julia, would you be happy for people to email you after this um, if they have any questions uh, that we haven't had time to answer this evening? Yes, very. That's no problem at all. They've been okay, great questions. So, so I look forward to answering some more. That's really good. So um, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. And um, I'm going to quickly pass back to Faye. Thanks, Sam. That was really great, everyone. Thank you so much for that. And I'm sure everyone enjoyed that, um, especially the Dipper information that was kindly shared with me that uh, it, it haunts me to this day in the office don't worry I, I have learned that lesson but I think we should also point out that Andy may have um, given himself away a little bit here because a quick google search revealed to me that Snickers haven't been known as Marathon Bar since 1990 so I before I think Sam, Megan and I were born <laughs> so that really made me chuckle. But um, I hope that you all enjoyed that as much as I did. As we mentioned, Juliet will be able to answer more questions through email. So um, I think a, sh a screen should come up very shortly with her email address that we can leave there for you. A huge thank you, of course, goes to Samuel and Megan for their excellent, excellent hosting today. Some great questions in there and some really great answers as well, of course. So a huge thank you to Andy and Juliet for joining us tonight. And of course, to all of you who are watching today, um, a thank you for joining us on a Saturday evening. If you enjoyed this session and the work that BTO does and learning more about the work that we do, you can find out more and find out how you can support us on our website, which is bto.org. And just as a final note that the final session of our annual conference will start in just under an hour, um, again, on Zoom or on YouTube or Facebook. And that will feature the brilliant Karen Cooper from North Carolina State University talking about citizen science as part of our 51st Witherby Memorial Lecture. So do make sure to tune in for that. And I'm sure all of us will be there. Um, we hope to see you there, but until then, or until next time, I think all that rests me to say is thank you everyone very, very much and have a great night.